with three really interesting speakers. Roisin Garvey, you're a senator for the Greens. Uh, you're an activist more. I've always known you locally as an activist around environmental issues. Um, yeah, someone very much rooted in the west of Ireland. Um, yeah, so we're delighted to have you. Yeah, Roisin made a big effort to get here after doing serious damage to her foot. Uh, you won't be connected to the, to the land with that foot for another while. Uh, Eddie, yeah. Eddie Lenehan is uh, possibly doesn't need an introduction. He's uh, a, a historian, a Shanaki, a storyteller. Um, yeah, and uh, at this stage, probably a legend. Uh, so, most welcome, Eddie. <laughs> Um, and Jennifer Hearn is a practicing artist and is currently doing a master's in anthropology, anthropology with a special interest in connection to the land. So I, I might start with you, Eddie, if that's all right. In the last session, we were all talking about regulations and rules and laws and, and difficulties, but uh, something underpins all of that, and it's that we've got an innate connection to the land, even if. Uh, Certainly in, in recent decades or maybe centuries, it's been lost maybe as we've drawn back from all needing to work on it. Um, could you maybe articulate you know, what our connection to the land was historically or, or from a, a mythical or mythological point of view uh, and your sense of, of where it's come to now? I don't mind with the mythology. What is it? I, I've been collecting stories for the last 47 years. I mean, I mean recording stories for 47 years now. I, I have a house full of recordings. And the funny thing is, they're worth millions and they're worth nothing. <laughs> That's the funny thing about recordings. Uh, if my house was to be robbed, <coughs> the beauty is robbers, thieves, Go for money, 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 to the side, to side. It's, it's worth nothing, nothing, nothing. And yet, this stuff is worth everything. I have six children, and none of them are interested. <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go, there you go. What do I do with it? It certainly won't be given to Claire. And these are all Claire people. Because the authorities in Clare, down the years that I have looked for help, have never given me a penny. Never. <coughs> and it's expensive work. It's expensive work, collecting stories. It has cost me, uh, I dread to think, every penny of it has come out of my pocket, 47 years of work. <coughs> what do I say about the old people who gave me the stories? They were delighted to listen. They were delighted to, to, to have somebody to listen to them. All they wanted was what is so fashionable nowadays. Oh, we all talk nowadays about the psychology of listening and all this. It takes a different thing to go in and listen night after night to somebody who might be rambling. <laughs> <laughs> who might be the most boring person in the world. <laughs> You don't say that today. Oh, nobody's boring today. Everybody's, every, you know, we're all PC today. We're all, it's in the radio all the time. But a lot of people are bloody well boring. <laughs> I'm boring too, I bet you, a lot, lot of the time. I'm an idiot. My wife, who drove me here today, she's out there in the car. No, she never listens to my stories. <laughs> and never has listened to me telling stories. But she plays golf. <laughs> and I think golf is the most stupid game in the world. <laughs> We've been married 47 years. Maybe that's why. <laughs> because we do completely different things. People who live inside in each other's ear. Not a good idea. Not a good idea, I think. Go do your own thing. I still stay married all that time. Uh, but, but, uh, it's, I've listened to stories in the most odd places from the most odd people and there are wonderful storytellers in their own way. The next book I'm doing is quite different from anything to do with the land and yet it's not because you get stories that you can fit into so many different contexts and they can be so different. The next book I'm doing is military memories about people's memories 
Irish people have very long memories, remember, going back as far as Cromwell, because Cromwell was a terrible bastard, you know. He was a racist, he was as bad as ISIS, and yet he was a wonderful general. He took advantage of the Irish because the Irish were so stupid. They fought each other, they were so busy killing and fighting each other. And then Cromwell, with his wonderful uh, new model army, came in and they were easy game for the likes of Cromwell because they kept fighting each other even when Cromwell had the wit to stop and say, look at this guy, if never before we need to join together, if never. But they did they kept fighting each other, in fact, they, you know, they couldn't get it out of their heads that this is a guy that we need to join up. And of course, the inevitable happened. The inevitable happened. They were massacred. And look at all the castles in County Clare, well, tower houses in County Clare, that we just find one little bit of them standing because of Cromwell or his minions. Uh, of his generals. Uh, Cromwell only lasted in, in Ireland for nine months, but he still <coughs> remembered to this very day uh, by old people. It was the worst curse you could put on a person, apart from a widow's curse, the curse of Cromwell on you and spit. You know, the curse of Cromwell. That was one of the worst curses you could put on an Irish person. Down over three centuries later, still remembered. I, when I started collecting stories back in the 70s, people in Kerry would still say that. <coughs> Terrible, long memory. But in that book will be things that, that men on the run, where they, where they had dugouts in the land, and the terrible things they got. Uh, not their pension, not yeah. their pension, but TB after it. TB. When the war was won and the black and tans were gone and the auxiliaries <coughs> were gone and the civil war was over and they might have their pension a little a few shillings a week but they had TB afterwards and the diseases they got after it from being cooped up in little, little dugouts in the bog during the war and they didn't get much out of the, the land mm. I tell you. It was misery and misfortune. That's, that's a really interesting place to jump out. <laughs> uh, thanks, Eddie. <laughs> Is that a you know connection to the land? It wasn't always a joyous thing. There was a lot of hardship, and in a lot of ways, we got away from it because uh, we maybe life became easier. We had cars to bring us around, and uh, and uh, a tractor would do the work of multiple men. Uh, do you have thoughts on kind of uh, where <laughs> we're at now, Roisin? compared to we were, where we're at, you're still a young woman, but when you were a child, or maybe in stories you hear from your family? Um, well, I suppose there's two things. There's land use and how we move, I think, are the two things that connect us to the land. If you move in a car, it disconnects you from the land, whereas if you move by walking or cycling, it connects you with the land and nature. So that's, I think, active travel and transport is a huge part of today mm -hmm. that we don't maybe recognise sometimes, as opposed to the traffic congestion and all that. It's also a disconnect from the land. And the second thing is, of course, the land use, which we've covered a lot. Now, I grew up picking stones and going to the bog, and it was all hardship, but it was, it was still a great crack. Mm. And it's when you had big families and all your neighbours came over and we had mehels. Mm. You don't see that now, you know. Mm. And my son has been to the bog twice, I think, and he wasn't really into that much at all. <laughs> but I, he was an only child. I didn't have four siblings for him to mess around with, you know mm. what I mean? Whereas I did. So I think for me, the way it's gone now, I, I'm hoping we're turning a corner. I think COVID to look at a silver lining of it, the people, the 2K limit or whatever they were doing, the 5K limit at the time, people rediscovered places they didn't, never even knew existed. <coughs> and like I remember doing the, so I worked on modal shift, getting people out of cars for 12 years full time with an NGO called Antarctica Green Schools. And that was a really learning curve for me because through doing events where kids in rural areas who had never walked to school and um, started walking to school even just once or one day a week, discovered a well or a neighbour they had never met and never knew hmm. and their parents didn't know them because we had become so disconnected. I actually find it quite upsetting to be honest with you because as a kid we knew everything about every we knew every bend, we knew every tree. Like I was lucky I was I was fluent in Irish so I also understood all the townlands and the names and we had names for our fields. And hmm. um, I grew up in a place called the field of the cow with the elder tree hmm. and my village is based on the fact that it had loads of ivy. So we always had the connection with place. And I remember doing a tree walk around Ireland 24 years ago, myself and a few friends collected half a million aluminium cans and turned the money into 
trees and we bought trees and we travelled around Ireland doing the tree walk. You might have heard of it, John Possum's been doing it for 20 years. And um, we also discovered everywhere we went to the town land and names and it, it always meant something and it still does. But people don't even know how to say the name of the town land they live in now or what it means. And they, they're, not, they're not taught it in school. I was in one school, they had a castle in the lawn and nobody knew what the name of the castle was. A ruin of a castle in the lawn. So there's that disconnect and I, I, I think how we transport ourselves, we can't all be farmers, we can't all access forests, you know, and all that kind of thing, but how we move has completely disconnected us. If you move in a metal box really fast, you don't get to talk to people, you don't smell the flowers, mm. you don't see the birds. You know, I've been in my house for three, it's my first time being out for three weeks out of my house, and my best friends were two fox cubs and a bumblebee. Mm. You know what I mean? And that's what you're saying. Mm. So. I, I always think like a hedgerow, uh, like and we covered them there's some hedgerows there are the most marvelous things that in a car they're nothing mm -hmm. they may as well not exist they yeah. just uh, so yeah i think it's a really interesting point and, and it's funny because as i said in the last one we were talking about laws and regulations and stuff but now we were going to more intangible stuff but actually jenny we've had some interesting conversations in the past about this idea of of the commons like places that were we were able to visit they were all of ours I know in many instances we're, ac we're actually maybe not even allowed visit, they've become, they've become private property. You, maybe you could talk a little bit about that area behind your house. And yeah, yeah, so I'm doing a project at the moment and there's a piece of land behind my house and <clears throat> I live in uh, Cork City and it's in quite, a, it would be quite a poor area, it wouldn't be an affluent area and um, it would have a lot of social issues as well as social housing there. and. This used to be an old dump. Um, Loftus used to, um, they, they dumped building rubble in there for about 12 years, but it's part of a river valley. Um, and in the last, I think they stopped dumping in there around 20, 20, uh, 2007. And since then it's, it's sort of rewilded itself. And it's full of foxes and rabbits and, and birds. There's endangered, loads of endangered species in there, uh, bats and newts, and the local travellers keep the horses in there. Um, and people have started, to, local <coughs> people walk their dogs in there, teenagers drink in there, it's people dump their rubbish in there. It's this sort of site, but also the government want to build a road through it. Um, and so I'm working on a project now to try and become, and, and just talking to the local TDs and to some of the local people, mm -hmm. they say that the area is it's kind of 40 years of neglect and it doesn't have, um, you know, how do you get people to love this place? You know, how do you get people to appreciate what's in front of them? And the river is really polluted and we're trying to get it cleaned up. Um, and I suppose it's it's a commons and it's being used in that way, but it's it's also private um, and, it's, and the government, they just want to, put a road through it and they don't care for what's in it um, and I've interviewed some local people there and you see, there's all sorts of, of, of things happening and there's bird trapping happens in there, badger baiting happens, it's literally all the kind of worst things and sort of some of the best things and it's uh, like this time of year it's beautiful, it's full of flowers and um, bird song and there's buzz a buzzard moved in there recently and um, I talked to some of the local TDs and, so, and a lo I had a local girl there recently and she had been in there as a kid. She said she remembers the rubble as a child, and um, you know they used to smoke fags in there when she was younger. And I had she hadn't been in there in a while, and she walked through with me. She said, "I can't believe how beautiful it is." Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, "I said we'd love to save it." And she said, I, "She was like, you'd be surprised at how many people around here would actually want that." But then at the same time, there's it's a real it's an interesting area because it's not far. They're they're not farmers, not ecologists. It's quite a neglected area in a lot of ways. So it's a real challenge um, and it's an interesting site mm. of, you know, how do you sort of get people to connect to it and, and fall in love with it. Yeah. Any, anyone who grew up in Cork in, in the 80s or 90s <coughs> will know the blue clock of uh, Douglas Court. It's actually lying sideways in that same Yeah, side. it was dumped in there and you yeah. can see bits of, because I was walking through there one day, I said, what's this blue glass? And, and the local TD I met, he told me it's, it was the old blue clock yeah. and the old merchant ski as well is in there. So it's full of rubble. But it's, it's kind of like the path, the least resistance, isn't it? It's like you've got housing here, you've got intensive dairy land here, and then you've got this wasteland that you said, uh, like the whole uh, spectrum of human life is playing out in from bird trapping or badger 
made into cigarette smoking to people walking their dogs which yeah. is kind of i know some of it's illegal but it's also beautiful the whole thing happening in there even like my granddad used to trap finches and the idea that there's you know still people up there trapping finches i know yeah. that appalls you that, but no, like, there's something I, kind I, of I, like I, so I, human I, about I, it you know it you know well, yeah. I, I, yeah, like, uh, it's uh, it, it actually it's, it's the really Valley. it's the Glen River Valley kind of coming from Dan Meyer into so the Glen Valley is this amazing piece of undervalued biodiversity in the middle of the city. It's better now. The city council have made an effort. To, someone did torch it there a couple of yeah, weeks ago. Did, yeah. But actually, if you look at that on a map, the valley stretches all the way out to Glen Meyer, and there's wild areas all the way out. It could be the most amazing urban park. Yeah. If only. There was a kind of a coalition of these these finch trappers and you know, you know <laughs> underage drinkers <laughs> saying we want to keep this place you know because it actually is important um, well, what's interesting too about it is because i spent my summers in kerry um in waterville in underring and kerry so it's really wild it's beautiful it's mythical and so it's so it's so easy and that's where my love of nature really came from just that freedom <laughs> of being out on the beach or uh, across the fields and it's easy to, to feel a connection to that land because it's so beautiful, it takes your breath away and it's got so much mythology and history. But this place is this old dump in the middle of a city that, you know, um, has no story to it really in that sense. And, but it's, there's something beautiful about it. And I think it's, and that's, uh, uh, you know, just on the talks last night, you know, talking about opening your heart to, your land, to the land and stuff. And, you know, it's very easy to say that for people in a, in a privileged position but in these neighborhoods where people just throw their rubbish on the floor they don't care how do you rally these people to, to love the mm, land you know mm, and that's mm. the real challenge i think it's, hard that, Russ, it's just an, it's an interesting thing about we have to look at our history as well you know and um i think eddie touched on this but when if you ever read brian freel's play translations uh, the irish people were so connected to the land and to the meaning the land had for them that there was a conscious part of part of colonizing was to change the place names mm. so they would have no meaning. Mm. And that was part of colonizing, mm. part of disconnecting the people from the land. So, you know, there's a huge thing in that, that now you have housing estates that are called Undera because mm. 400 years ago there was a lovely oak tree or they cut mm. it down to build the estate. But that's the only connection people have. So I think it's, you know, that reconnection is so important. And even if it's in a, a apartment block, like there's a place I cycle past every day to go to work and it's the flats. And they had a space probably the size of this room. But over the lockdown, they built a uh, sand bay, they built an outdoor blackboard. They, like they, just with this space, what they created there, and the amount of things the kids get up to in that small <coughs> space. Mm. And here we are with all this space. Mm. You know, it's, it's not all about owning land. You know, there's also, like, we got um, a bit of land in Ina, and I promised the kids I'd get a playground in Ina. But I also had a grant for biodiversity, so now we have it surrounded by an orchard and a native woodland and a wild flower garden. So there's, you know, there's ways of doing things, but there is going to be conflict. You know, build the bridge, don't build the road. You know, greenways are great, but don't kill one flower. There's, this is where the whole thing is moving now with connection of the land I'll and the environmental movement. And we have to be careful because we're all on the same side. And, you know, we don't want to, as, as we don't want to be polarized. Mm. And we have to be careful of that. I, I love the way the townland names can be maybe instructive. I, I, I might have used this example and I'm, um, last night to, to make another point but i was at a conference last week and they were talking about uh, sending sheep farmers and carry up up the mountains with knapsacks of of i think sufflux is the chemical to spray off bracken you know and like all of these upland valleys or a lot of them especially the stony ridges in kerry have deer or dyer or whatever uh, in the name indicating oak presence and now there's a conservation objective that it's like well now this needs to be managed as as a heat or whatever it might be and it's a, you know the, the townland is kind of saying this this could this was oak before and the bracken is saying this could be oak again and yet we're yeah we're a little we're somewhat blind to it um I, I, you're a, in a past life you're a teacher eddie um, yes. Yeah, do you think? I escaped. Uh, good man. Good man. <laughs> Me too. <I'm> Me too. And my sister was a teacher, and my wife was a teacher, and we all escaped. Yeah, nice that's good. <laughs> well, Before yeah. we lost our sanity. I, I hate to ask you such a practical question, but are there 
things we could do within the education system to kind of re-establish this connection. You know, I, I know they say in Finland, we're always referring to the Nordic countries, that they don't even do any reading or maths till they're eight or nine. They just want them to play. And, you know, I, say, I remember seeing one group of, of kids, that there's these, no, well, we've got one here, a, a little forest school, where the kids are just allowed outside. They're not expected to learn. They're just expected to play outdoors, whatever the weather might be. Uh, do you have thoughts on, 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 on within the education system what could be changed to kind of re-establish a better connection that would help us kind of rehabilitate these damaged ecosystems that we have? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the education system is expected to do too much. Mm. Mm. Too much, too mm. much, too much. Yeah. Uh, I, visit, I visit schools regularly now telling stories. That's my business. But I have noticed uh, in latest times, uh, and I, I send back the reports. I, I, you know, that's what I'm expected to do to the Arts Council. And I'll tell, I'll tell it as I see it. I won't be nice if nice isn't um, called for. If the if if the school that I'm going to, how would I put it? If I'm welcomed in the school. Uh, for what I'm supposed to do, to tell stories, and, and I'll answer the questions I'm asked. I was at, for example, uh, last month, a school in County Limerick, and I was, <coughs> I was taken aback. The staff room there was, I went in, at lunch, nobody talked to me. Oh, Jesus. Nobody talked to me. Nobody showed the slightest interest in why I was there. I was never asked why I was there. Now, I wondered, what the hell did they invite me here for? <laughs> now, uh, it happened that the woman who invited me was out that day. Fair enough. But what were the rest of the teachers doing? They were all there, stuck to their tablets. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, no, no doubt preparing classes. Mm -hmm. But Jesus had anybody the manners, sheer manners, yeah. to talk. To oh. a stranger, I was saying to myself, uh, "What kind of an education are the children in this goddamn place getting? If that's the way the teachers are behaving." Not just the, the, the manners, I would have said the curiosity. If you walked into a room, I'd just have to talk to you. If you were, are you, are you, are you, are you, or anybody walked in, you'd surely just say, mm. "Out of, just out of." Mm. Mm. Jesus, I better talk to this ah, person ah. since nobody else is talking to mm -hmm. them. And nobody did. Mm -hmm. And none of the authorities showed up. The, vin the, the vice principal or the principal. The only nice person there was when I arrived at the door because it was a big school, a secondary school. Uh, I didn't know which door to come to. And a, a young fella came out, a lovely young fella, and pointed me in the right direction, go down that long corridor. And the only nice person mm. I met all day, apart from the young lads in the classrooms, they were great. But, uh, and when I was going, uh, I had to go and nobody in the staff room even said goodbye. Jesus. I walked out of that goddamn staff room and nobody even said, good luck, thanks for coming. Yeah. I, I walked out of the place and nobody said a word. There, there's such a focus and I totally agree, we, we ask schools to do too much, they're responsible for kids' diet, for their oh, behaviour, the whole the whole thing. And uh, you're a STEM teacher, Russian, you're physics and maths, I think, and I know you're a strong advocate of it, I think you're the same one. You know, these are really important, but, but STEM is a subset, you know, of, uh, you know, a healthy ecosystem, and it's also a subset of, of healthy interactions between human beings. They should be priorities that we live in, a, in functional ecosystems and that we're able to relate with each other and be happy in ourselves. And it seems like, you know, what you're saying is we're, we're, we've maybe taken our eye off the I prize. Having, um, I was doing bike mechanic workshop with teenage girls in the secondary school and these, these were all studying honours physics for the leave insert. And when I had them a spanner, they had no idea what to do with it. <laughs> you know, and I taught leave insert physics. I was teaching this school now, I'd given up teaching. But they they'd been they could do the formula for the fulcrum and the force and all that and they had a clue, no concept of putting it on the six sided nut to twist the goddamn thing. Mm -hmm. And literally to hold them by the hand and there's something wrong. That's not the school's fault. I mean, it's not it's not even the teacher's and fault. What we do at home and how we move mm -hmm. around and education was about making sure they can read and write and do a few sums. Mm -hmm. there's, not huh? like a, there's not a lot of capacity in society, you know, you've got no. two parents working. Yeah. 
there isn't the same sort of capacity at home. So. Oh, no, look at how much time they spend their mobile phones. I mean, yeah. the, the parents are spending more time on their phones than the kids are. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't buy into the fact that they have to work in such cost of living. We have to all work all the time. Like, what are they doing when they're not at work? Are, I mean, you get home from work at five or six in the evening. Are you turning on the television then? Are you going on your computer? Are you helping your kids, getting your kids to help you prepare the dinner? Like, you, you know, I, I just don't think we can use that as an excuse for everything all the time. I think they're rushing, like, in terms of, like, people's time, you know, to time. Like, look, and actually confidence, like, just coming back to the teacher thing. I remember working with a group of teachers down in Curra Chase in Limerick, and I said, just out of interest, you know, they, they give us uh, give us all the native trees, you know. And the, these were these were all 500 pointers in their leaving, so bright kids, whatever, you know, and they were in third year in Mary I. And they said, oh, um, ash. This is 20, 20 of them, and one of them said, oh, Hawthorne, and that was it. That was it. So they don't have the information themselves, and they're not confident in communicating it, but they're also not confident in, in bringing kids outdoors. And I think at some level, like parents are the same, but our parents, I think, are really caught from a time point of view. You know, both of them are working, and then they have this well, little I'm time. I'm single parents working full time, and I still, it's your priority, it's your priority. Yeah. Like, I see it at trying to find My son is 23 now, and just in, like, I've got friends whose kids are 10 years younger than mine, or 20 years younger. Now, of course, it was easy for me because it was less of the round, but he was around. He wanted his DS and his TV, and I was like, no. Because then you're fighting with him all the time about that thing. It's just creating more options. I mean, yeah. we have as much time as we've ever had. Yeah. Just on what Eddie said, and probably what Roshan was saying there, I think the experience he probably had in secondary school, it might be more of a reflection on what's happening in society in general, that the yeah. teachers are busy, or they think they should be busy, or they are actually busy, or parents are busier because they think they should be busier or they are busier and the time has been sucked away from maybe what it should be like just say communicating with someone who's walking to staff mm. more spent so I think it's maybe it's bigger than you've seen it in a, a school setting that maybe wasn't that way 10 years ago but you could probably go into another workplace which is very fr fr very fr uh, and yeah and I there it's a, it's a mixed bag I go into schools a bit and mm. you go into some staff rooms and it's great it's real good interaction but I must say I've been in many of them where well, you're I, just I've like my god years. yeah I've seen it in 10 years it's uh, changed yeah, even it's as a teacher but I mean it, it, it means it enables people who want to really want to become a teacher become one because like when I did the HD to become a maths and physics teacher you basically just filled out a form yeah. you didn't have any interview at least with Trinity you to write a letter but you've all the people then who don't even like teenagers or like their subjects yeah imparting knowledge to adolescents who are just craving for adults who care or are passionate for anything. Jenny, you, like, you have two girls and like, I have a fairly good idea of how you raised them. They were pretty free range, weren't they? You just, <laughs> just did everything in the wildest, outdoorsiest way. Like, uh, um, <laughs> did it stick? With the girls? Um, I tried to keep the mobile phones and the TVs away from them as long as possible. My aim with the phone was to try and get them to 16, but I got them to 13. Um, <coughs> but I noticed a huge difference in in kids that had, because we didn't have a TV at home. Like they'd watch TV in their nanas, but they didn't watch, I purposely kept it out of the house. Now they could watch uh, movies and stuff like that. But when they would have friends visiting, um, you can always tell the kids that were, were had similar situations at home because as soon as they came together, their imaginations went mental. And they'd go outside and they'd be making up some games or some treasure hunter or something, they'd be mad playing. And then you'd have the kids that have a lot of TV or older siblings that'd be on the phones or whatever, and they'd come over and they literally wouldn't know how to play. You know? mm. And I think though, just what we were saying there, with what you, you mentioned, Roisin, about the traveling around, how we move around. And that disconnect, like, I think society as a whole, like, the, everything is sped up. Everything's faster. People have to work faster. more now. Yeah. We have to, there's a constant pressure all the time to mm. pay bills. And it used to be the case where you could have one income in the house. Now you have to have two incomes mm. in the house. It's much more difficult nowadays to, to, um, to make a living. And, and I think there's... We've kind of fallen into this sort of way of being that's very disconnected from everything, and it's not just the teachers; it's the whole system. It's consumerism, isn't it? Really? It's consumerism, yeah. It's it's everything. Well, like I, I just saw in the news there during the week that we've kind of we, we've the highest population since 1841, and mm -hmm. the reality is, even though there has been some uh, kind of relatively decent recovery of rural populations, uh, you know, most of that new population is is urban centered and that's a reality uh so do you i don't know you you work with policy a bit do you, do you have thoughts on how we can kind of look the reality is you know notwithstanding some catastrophe which may happen we're not all going back working with the land working with our hands 
uh, in the mm. near future. So how do we facilitate reconnection when we're not kind of as you were nudged or pushed towards it? Like? Well, I continue yeah. now. Yeah. I, I take the point you're saying there. My people are all harness makers. My father, my uncle, my grandfather. That's as near to the land as you can get unless you're a, a farmer or a blacksmith. But there was the other side of the land as well, of course. We needn't romanticize. Mm. That was the bad side. Why did so many people immigrate? And, uh, and remember, there was only room on the land for one, the mm. eldest son. Mm. The other eight had to find other accommodation, we'll say, be it good or bad or immigration or whatever. But the next book I'm doing, as I say, The Military Memories, um, I found, and I'm going through that section of it now, about the land war, the 1880s, 1879 to 1885, roughly. And the trouble of the RIC during that. And remember, the RIC have got a bad press, but every one of them were Irishmen. And they were all farmers' sons, mainly small farmers' sons, because you see, it was a respectable job and had a pension. And if you were a big man, strong fella, you had to be a certain height, uh, you'd get into the RIC, and not everybody did. So it was a great job at the time. A very desirable job. But one story, just as an example now, uh, of the other side of the land uh, thing. I found in Kerry, where I'm from, that there was this particular man and <coughs> cattle had been uh, taken by the agent for non-payment of rent. Now, this was in South Kerry. <laughs> uh, and the man that took them, the agent that took them, of course he would have some agents with him to confiscate the cattle and they were taking them to Tralee, to the pound. Now, on their way they stopped in Fadden Fall, where the train passes even to this very day, uh, for a drink because they were walking the cattle of course, that time there was no trucks, no nothing like that, they were walking the cattle and they stopped in Fadden Fall into the pub there, which is still there today also, for a drink and they left a man outside stand to the cattle but the man that the cattle had been taken from because he was following and following and following he wouldn't go to let him take his cattle if he could uh, do anything about it himself and a couple of his neighbours were following and they saw where the boys had gone in and he went to a shop a mile down the road and he bought a pint of uh, a gallon of paraffin oil and came up while the boys were inside having their drinks and one of his friends came he had a, he had a revolver and up the old man's head that was guarding the, the, the cattle outside and there one word and the other dead man and the other they didn't go in they didn't go in because they knew that the fellows inside were armed and what do you think your man did that had the paraffin oil poured it over the cattle put a match to them and burn the cattle alive. Tough times, tough men. Wow. Tough men, but, but, yeah. But rather than give them to the bailiff, he'd burn them alive. Wow. I'm just trying to think so. of one, like, clear thing around the connection to the land that, you know, because we, as I said, we don't, we're not all farmers, but I do think we, we spend less per capita mm. on food than any other country in Europe. Mm. And, uh, like, for, I studied organic horticulture for a year in John Collar, I don't know, 25 years ago. And what I didn't know till then was the nutritious value and how it's, you know, it's four to ten times more. But, and, and, and people say, you know, but not everybody can afford it and all that. But we spend so little on our food and we spend lots of money on clothes we don't need and Wi-Fi and, you know, all those things. Consumers, so we spend 9% of the money we earn on food when actually it's the number one thing that is the most important thing to get into us and our children. Mm. But we'll buy them plastic shit they don't need and four devices, but we'll buy the 29 cent peas or spuds going off in Aldi. And like, people say that's not fair social justice, social economically, but every sector of society is throwing away half their food mm -hmm. from every social economic background. Mm -hmm. So if we value food more and we pay more for our food, then growers get to survive and use the land more. Mm. And mm. I hate the thing organic, but actually you've all these chemical veg that we're buying all the time that's absolutely not good for us. We have a million people waiting for some operation or other from the state 
and nobody's discussing the fact that how are we all so unhealthy? I mean, I know there's HSE and you blame the government and you blame the state and you blame the health, but we have to take personal responsibility for our own health and prevention is better than cure. And spending more money on good quality food instead of random crap we don't need could be a complete game changer and it would support farmers and growers in, the, in this country, you know. It's a really interesting point, I think, because in a lot of ways, chemicals would have displaced labour. You know, before, you know, I don't, I've seen some of the, the organic farms even today and they have a kind of a sled on the back of a tractor and there might be four people lying on the sled picking out the weeds because that's the labour it takes if you're not willing to use glyphosate or whatever it might be. So that, uh, it's an interesting one. If we could move more people back to actually to doing the work, there might be better connection.